Hi, and welcome to the course. I'm going to start by talking about what R is. If you register for the class, I imagine you might have some idea, um, but I think it's worth going into a little bit more some of the characteristics that make R interesting and different from some other options that you might have. So I've laid out here some of the features that I see as being really key in making R what it is. Uh, first of all, it is a programming language, and it's one that's particularly good for doing data analysis and statistics. Um, it's also not just what you initially pull down. That's the base package, but it also has a whole ecosystem of other packages that people have created. Uh, many of them users who have evolved in to kind of creators of, of these packages that are available for you to add on and expand the functionality of the initial software that you pull. Um, it's also free and open source software, and I'm going to talk a lot more in a bit about what that means. And finally, it's an interpreted language, and that's another point that I'll come back to. R is popular in a number of fields right now. It, um, it really grew up in statistics and biostatistics as, as a tool for that, so it has retained its popularity there and has a number of algorithms for various statistical functions and is often one of the first places where you can find uh, code that, that, that brings in a new statistical technique you might want to try out. It's also pretty popular in machine learning along with Python and in other fields everything from ecology to financial engineering um, and in areas like, like data journalism for, for people who want to be able to add visualizations as they're writing articles. I put in here a quote, uh, the best thing about R is that it was developed by statisticians. The worst thing about R is that it was developed by statisticians. And this rings true a little bit. So because it was developed by statisticians, it is very attuned to the needs of data analysis and statistics. And it's also got wonderful algorithms for a lot of what you might want to do on that end. Um, but it does have some characteristics that make it a bit different, especially from some other languages that you might be more familiar with if you have coded in the past. I've listed here some other popular programming languages for statistical computing and data analysis. Those include SAS, SPS, and MATLAB. All three of those are um, proprietary software rather than open source software. But there are some other open source software options available as well. Julia is one that's kind of up and coming at the moment, and then Python's also very popular for data science and for machine learning. So let's talk about this idea of free and open source software, because that does distinguish languages like Julia and Python and R from some of the others that you might have seen um, in courses or books or, or in working with your advisors. So I've done a little bit of a cartoon here for how a lot of software is created. So when you have software that is a working program on your computer, typically that will mean that somewhere on your computer it has saved what's called binary code for that program. This is a file that if you tried to open it up in a text editor, editor it would look like gobbledygook. You wouldn't be able to tell what was going on. But this is this is the software at the point when it's been translated for the machine to understand rather than you. Now this binary code has been developed from source code and that source code, especially for languages like, like C, that source code ends up being compiled into the binary code. Now if you can open the source code, if you're a programmer, you can understand what's going on for that unlike the binary code. So. We can talk then about how software can be free, because there are a few ways that it can be free. Um, and there's some of these come in with the ideas of the open source. So if you get the binary code itself for software without having to pay for it, that's what we call free as in beer. You didn't have to give over any money for it. Um, you might come across these fairly often now in places like an app store where you can get a piece of software for free but you aren't provided access to the source code. You just get the piece that runs on your computer and that your computer can read. Another word that's often used for, for this idea of free is in beer, free that you didn't have to pay anything, is gratis. The other thing that you can have is free is in speech, something that's open that you can explore and see how it's really working. 
So we refer to it this way if you actually have access to the source code, to the, the instructions that a human programmer was creating uh, for, for this particular piece of software, where you can actually see and understand the logic yourself. And this is something that we also refer to as Libra. So for R, R is both of these types of free. You don't have to pay anything for it. Um, and that's the free part, but it's also open source. You can download and explore all of the code that builds it. With software that's open source, that free is in speech, you can do a number of things. So you can, as I just mentioned, you can explore the code, you can see how it works. You can also share that code and the software that comes with it with other people. And finally, um, under certain restrictions, depending on the license, you can make changes that you want to the code as long as you attribute the original and then create modifications to it that might work better for you. So there are a number of reasons that free and open source software is popular and it seems to be even gaining more and more in popularity. Um, I think some people have kind of a knee-jerk reaction that it might not be as secure, as proprietary, or as well tested even. Um, but I think that, that that's a little bit, especially for kind of really well-developed free and open source software, that that's probably a little bit wrong. And I think that this quote's really interesting. It's from the New York Times a few years ago. And it talks about this idea of what kind of software should we put on the machines that we use at a, at, at a voting location. And uh, they're talking about the idea of using open source software on bills. And one of the, the reasons compelling that is that it might actually be more secure than something that's proprietary. When something's open source and many people get the chance to go and explore the code, a lot of times we say with many eyes the bugs are shallow. People are going to find problems that are in there and, and, and places where there could be a vulnerability and then you get the chance to fix that. Uh, free and open source software is also becoming something that a lot of funding agencies on the scientific side are interested in. So traditionally, we, we do research on the scientific side and we might put uh, our findings out as papers and go and present on that, and that's moved the science forward. Um, but there's this growing idea that it's really important to have the tools to, and even at a software level. So this is an example where I pulled some language from a call that went out a couple of years ago from the NIH. And in this case, they're very specifically asking for open source tools through what they're funding. Last, I want to talk a little bit about the idea of R as an interpreted language and what that means. So I've done a bit of a, a cartoon graph here of um, some of the types of languages or software that you can have. And if you start at the very top, you've got some of the point and click graphical user interfaces these are programs like Excel or Word where you use your mouse a lot and you're really clicking on a lot of buttons or highlighting things that you want to change. At the very other end of the scale, we have machine code. So this is really getting down towards that binary of something that the computer can understand but you can't. This is just a touch above that where, where um, you're really coding things kind of at the zero and one level. Above that are assembly languages. These require a lot of work as well in terms of if you are the programmer telling the computer exactly where in memory to store something and when to pull something out and you have to break things down into very, very small and discrete steps. And then moving up, there are some things that are a little bit easier for, for people to put together. So there are compiled languages like C and Java and then interpreted languages like R and Python. Now the key difference between these two, with compiled languages, you write out your whole program as, as a batch program. So you've got it all together. And then you compile that and you send it to the computer and the computer runs the whole thing at once. With interpreted languages, you can actually kind of have a conversation with your computer. So you might ask it to read in a data set, and then it does that, and it says it's done that, and you can ask it to give you a summary of that, and then it does that, and then you can ask it to, to pull out a subset of that, and you keep that back and forth as you're working with the data, rather than needing to put all of your instructions first and then send that whole thing in as you would with a compiled language. 
So a few other characteristics that, that I think kind of define these, as you move down the scale, you get to things that are typically faster for the computer. So these are really the machine code and assembly languages. Those are things that are written for the computer and it can efficiently handle those. Trying to do the same thing from an interpreted language or a point and click type of software will typically take the computer a lot longer. For a lot of what we do right now, you can't really notice that difference, but as you get to a really large data set or something else that's really drawing on the resources of your computer, that can make more of a difference. On the flip side, we've got kind of the opposite gradient in terms of how fast it is for a pretty new user to figure out how to do something. In some cases, even a very experienced user. So it's pretty easy and intuitive usually to use these point and click type of software. And R and Python, once you get the hang of them, they're really not much less intuitive, I don't think. Um, you can really get a lot done very quickly. As you move down where you have to be very discreet and you have to have lots and lots of steps where you define each one and you have to think a little bit more like the computer, um, it takes a lot longer to develop the code to do something. So these are much slower for the user. The other gradient that we have here is how much you can get your computer to do versus how much time it takes you to figure out how to do it for the first time when you want to do it. So down at assembly language and machine code, some of these deeper ones, um, you can get the computer to do almost anything. You're only restricted by things like its memory and its speed. But there's really a lot of flexibility if you can figure out how to ask it for it to do it. On the other hand, for some of these upper level languages and point and click software, you're restricted just to the set of functionalities that whoever designed that software put in there. Um, so that restricts you a little bit more in terms of what you could do. Although I would argue that for interpreted languages and down at this point, there's so much that's been created that there's not a lot of restriction on that level anymore. And then finally, um, you can figure out very quickly how to do something for the first time in a point and click software program like Excel or Word, whereas it can take a very long time on some of these others. So again, that kind of gradient between things that are easy and quick for the computer versus things that might be easier and quicker for you as the programmer.